Hi, this is Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. Fred Price passed away last night at the age of 89. For those of you who aren't familiar with him, he was one of the greatest faith teachers I've ever heard, probably second only to Kenneth Hagin. Fred Price preached in several denominations in the 50s and 60s and then founded Crenshaw Christian Center in Inglewood, California in the early 1970s after receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit and reading books on faith by Kenneth Hagin. Let me read an excerpt from Kenneth Hagin's book, Plans, Purposes, and Pursuits. I remember the first time I ever met Fred. Back in the early 70s, we were conducting a seminar in Albuquerque, New Mexico. My attention kept being drawn toward a nice-looking black man sitting in the congregation. I finally asked my son-in-law, who is he? My son-in-law had met Fred Price, and he explained that Fred was a pastor who had come across some of my books. He was so hungry for God that he had read every one of them. When he learned that I was going to be in Albuquerque, he came to the meeting to check us out. During the course of that seminar, Fred approached me and asked, Would you come to a black church even if it's small? I said, I'll go anywhere God says to go. I'm not tied to anything. If God says go, I'm going to follow his plan. So I held a meeting in Fred's church. And to tell the truth about it, I hadn't been in a church building that small for a long time. His main auditorium seated 150 people, and he had a little side room where a few folks could be seated. So many people came to the meeting that they had to stand behind the platform. In the course of time, his church grew to about 300 people, and he had to buy a bigger building. The new building seated 1,200 people. Over the years, Fred kept following God's plan and working in the light of it, and today he has more than 15,000 members. That's quite a little growth. While he was there, he prophesied over Fred Price that God would raise him up to take the message of faith to the African-American church. Over time, Crenshaw Christian Center grew from a few hundred members to over 25,000. Fred and his wife, Betty, had a son who was struck and killed by a car in 1962 when he was eight years old. When Betty got pregnant at age 44, Kenneth Hagin prophesied that they would have a son who would help them in their ministry. That son is Fred Price Jr., who is now the pastor of Crenshaw Christian Center. When I started at Kenneth Hagin's Bible School, Rama Bible Training Center in 1982, the first thing we did during orientation was watch Fred Price's video series on faith, foolishness, or presumption, which was based on a book he wrote by the same name that addressed the error and extremism that he had dealt with as the pastor of a Word of Faith megachurch back in the 1970s. I also saw him speak at Kenneth Hagin's camp meeting crusade in Tulsa in the early 80s. He was awesome. In 2009, he turned his church over to Fred Jr., who I interviewed in a video last year. Rather than do a lot of talking, I'm going to show you some clips of Brother Price over the years. This first clip is from the mid-1970s, teaching on how faith works before they built the faith dome. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Now, that's where most people stop reading, unfortunately, right there. Ah, oh, yes, Brother Price. Hallelujah. I've always believed in God. Yes. Ever since I was a little boy, I've always believed in God. Yes, I believe in God. Grandma believed in God. Great-grandpa believed in God. Uncle Clarence was a deacon. He believed in God. Oh, yes, we've always believed in God. Hey, it didn't stop there. Don't stop there. There's a little word that goes after that. A conjunction, you know, a little bridge that ties two things together. Notice. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that means that God exists, and something else. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently, not haphazardly, not sometimes on and sometimes off, Not hot and cold, but must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, see, folks haven't been believing that part because they've been accusing God of all the crimes that have happened. Huh? Somebody, some little kid gets run over. We saw an accident the other night. 
And uh, in the rain, the cars were all smashed up. There was a bicycle that we don't know. We, you know when we got there, we couldn't see what had happened. But a uh, little kid gets run over, and, and then the, they have the funeral, you know, and that silly preacher gets up in the pulpit and says, Well, now, the Lord has given, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, I've been there. Oh, yes. I sat on the front row in the church. My little boy was in a coffin, eight years old. Oh, I've been, I know what I'm talking about, I've been there. Honey, listen. And then he get up and say, The Lord took him. Oh, God looked down from the lofty pinnacles of heaven, and he looked at his garden, and there was a spot for one more little rose. So he reached down into the earth realm and plucked up a little rose, took him up to heaven. Junk! That's junk. That's not God. You call that a reward? Taking your little child? That's a reward. Hey, if that's a reward, I don't want any rewards. Keep them. No, that's not a reward. Jesus said very plainly, the thief cometh but for to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And it's not abundant life when they steal your husband, they steal your wife, they steal your kids. In the 1980s, they bought the old Pepperdine University campus and built the Faith Dome that seated 10,000 people. It was at this time that his television ministry began to reach just about every market in the country. Here's a clip of him preaching there. He was still God before he created you. So why would he be concerned? Why would he go to all this trouble to bind up all this information over 6,000 years of human history for our benefit? He doesn't need it. If you go bankrupt, don't change God. He's still God. Just because you're bankrupt, the universe is not bankrupt. Just because you're in a divorce court or in separation, what's that to God? Why should he care? But he must care. And he's trying to help us so that we can maximize the purpose for our creation. God didn't create us to suffer. God didn't create us to be uptight, been out of shape, mind gone, can't think straight, can't act straight. That, that, that wasn't God's purpose. But if we don't understand that knowledge wins battles, then we're going to have problems. Did you find Isaiah? Now, we just read in Hosea, what did God say? Stop. Again. Now, the word destroyed is a combat term. And it indicates that a battle raged and somebody lost. Destroyed, that's a combat term. Now watch this. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13. Therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. <laughs> now, not only are you destroyed, but you now have become a captive. That's called bad news, called six o'clock evening news. <laughs> Listen, therefore, here's God again giving his estimate. What does he say? He says, therefore, my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Hosea tells us that ignorance can cause our destruction, and Isaiah tells us that ignorance can put us into captivity. It is clear that ignorance cannot keep us from being destroyed or taken captive, but knowledge can. But knowledge can. In 1988, he spoke at the Victory Christian Center word explosion in Tulsa. This is one of the greatest faith messages I've ever heard. Whosoever, say whosoever, say whosoever, say I am a whosoever. That's who you are, whether you know it or not. 
For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say, 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 say unto the mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. That means your spirit and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe, where? In his spirit, that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He, Jesus Christ, said, he shall have whatsoever he saith. He did not say whatsoever was good. He said whatsoever. You keep talking death, that's what you're going to have. You keep talking sickness and disease, that's what you're going to have. You keep talking poverty, that's what you're going to have. You keep talking problems, and that's what you're going to have because you're going to create the reality of them with your own mouth. That is a divine law. Jesus said, whosoever saith, yes. yes. shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come, yes. shall come, yes. shall come, yes. shall come, yes. shall come to pass, shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he said. Notice, he said, you have what you say, not what you believe. Well, I believe. I believe. You don't get it because you believe. You will only get it because you say it. Now, what you say ought to be based on what you believe, and what you believe ought to be based on what thus saith the Lord. I picked this up 18 years ago. This is why I say I don't think I'm for this world. Because I really do, I feel strange around most Christians because when you start talking like this, that means they start looking at you crazy. And I don't need that. But I tell you what, I've got the victory. And I want to say to you, Carl, you said something this afternoon in your message. You said you, you, you're tired of people lying to you and telling you about how easy it is. I'm not the one that said it was easy, brother. Jesus said it was easy and he's not a liar. He said he's the way, the truth, and the life. And I hear him saying, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, not more trial, tribulations, and the backside of some dumb mountain. He said, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I didn't say it. Jesus did. Now, the reason that it's been hard for most of you is because you've been carrying them yourself, and you don't have to carry them. I found out that 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your care on him, for he careth for you. And if I have cast my care on him, that means that him has it, and if him does, I don't, and if I don't, I'm free. Now, if you don't understand that, you ought to get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, and you will. But see, we go right along picking up our burden, talking about, well, I'm just, I've had it such a hard, 1988 has been so rough for me. Friend, and I stand a great risk at what I'm going to say now, but so be it. It's still the truth, and the truth will make you free. For 18 years, I have never had a down day. Never had a down day. Don't intend to ever have any. I retired from down days 18 years ago. <laughs> now, that's not my problem. If you want them, you can have them. There are a, a whole lot of them out there, all varieties, any color, size, and shape you want. You're welcome to them. I retired from them. I've never had a down day. I've never been discouraged in 18 years. Now, don't misunderstand me. See, I've had many opportunities, the same opportunities that everybody else has. I'm in the same world. I got the same devil, but I've learned how to say passe <laughs> And that means pass on by. <laughs> Woo! Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. <laughs> See, I cast all my care on him. I cast my ministry on him. It's his ministry, it's not mine. I'm going to do my part. I have my assignment. I'm going to carry it out. I have no problem with it. It's not my ministry. People don't belong to me. They belong to the Lord. I'm an under-shepherd. I'm a caretaker. They belong to Jesus. All I'm supposed to do is feed the sheep and feed the lambs. Jesus will take care of the rest. Now, let me say this to you, and I've never really said this in this context, but I need to say this because a lot of people, you listen to the devil, you'd rather listen to the devil than the Word of God because you get a lot of sympathy that way, and you can cry and whine. See, and our egos get, see, we don't have anything else to cry about. See, I haven't cried in 18 years. 
Now, my wife can tell you, I used to be a crybaby. I, I was a world champion warrior. I was a world champion crybaby. I had a PhD degree in crying. I, can, I could whine in several octaves at the same time. I kid you not. You talk about crying. I'd talk, I, in, in fact, whenever I'd see somebody, I'd give them an organ recital. You know what an organ recital is? My ear hurts, my nose hurt, my eyes hurt, my lungs hurt, my chest hurt, my stomach, organs. You know, organ recital. Oh. But I retired. I cast all. See he, see, he won't touch him if you don't cast all of them on him. All. He said, casting all your care. Come here, Billy. This is, the way we, this is the way we do it, see? This is exactly the way we do it. I'm going to give you a demonstration. Come over here, Billy. Billy Joe, I'm going to show you. This, this is exactly the way we do it. See, we go down life with, with our burdens, our cares, our trials, and our tribulations. Poor old us. The devil just been whipping our heads. Poor old us. Ain't it a shame, y'all? I mean, y'all pray for me. I mean, I, I'm really having it tough. Well, here I go, I'm down, going down. These birds, they, they have me weighted down. I can't hardly walk because of this load. I mean, I'm struggling through life. And, and, and burdens, burdens are real. Pain is real. Fear is real. Lack and want and poverty and not enough money is real. I'm not saying it's not real. It's real. And you carry all that mess on your back and you will be bent over struggling down the road of life. And here you go, down the road, you're struggling. Here I am coming up here to maybe center. Billy Joe's coming and he says, well, what, who is that out there with that, with that great big sack on his back? So he stops, gets out of his car, comes over, looks underneath the, the great big load I'm carrying and says, Brother Fred, what, what are you doing? Well, Billy, I got a minister tonight. I'm, getting, I'm going over to maybe center. He said, well, what's that on your back? He said, oh, that's, these are my cares, my, my burdens and my trials and my tribulations. It's my wife and my children and my ministry and, and, and not enough money and, 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 He said, well, brother, brother Fred, you're not going to make it. I mean, the service is just about to start and, and you'll never make it like this. I'm going to help you out. You go right on down there and be on time. Come on, Billy Joe. And so I roll, watch it now, I roll my care over on his shoulder. You got it? Okay. Now, now who has it? I said, who has it? Who doesn't? And then here's the way you go, right on down the road of life. We don't even see it. And we're just as proud about it. Hallelujah. I'm just having such a hard time. I'm not. I'm going to tell you a lie. I got good news for you. I'm tired of the six o'clock evening news. Bad news. How many planes crashed? How many women were raped? How many babies were born out of wedlock? How many yes. adulteries were committed? How many this, that, and the other? I'm here to tell you there's some good news. Yes. yes. I'm a free man in Jesus. Glory. I don't have trials and tribulation. I have opportunities for them, but I've cast them all on him because he told me to cast all my cares on him because he cares for me. If I have cast them on him, then I don't have them and I am free. And if I say I'm not, I'm a liar and I'm going to have the power of Satan working in my life because I'm going contrary to what God's word says. Now, I want to tell you this because a lot of you still, you're sitting out there, ah, well, he just don't understand. Okay, big mouth, let me tell you about it. I don't usually do this, but I want you to know because this may be my last time to ever speak here. <clears throat> 18, in 18 years, Never been discouraged. Never had a down day. No blue Mondays, red Tuesdays, purple Wednesdays, chartreuse Thursdays, black Fridays, green Saturdays, and purple Sundays. Every day is a good day. I'm on top every day. Never discouraged. Never, never, never been discouraged in 18 years. I've had a thousand opportunities to be discouraged. But as I told you, I retired from them. Because, you see, I walk 
by faith. Turn to 2 Corinthians quickly. 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 4, or 5 rather. Now you'll have to think about this because if you don't, you'll think I'm, I'm trying to say something that I'm not trying to say. All I'm trying to tell you is what God said. I, I got all this out of the Word of God. And I found out God tells the truth. All right, listen to, listen to this. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 says, For we walk by what? Faith. Not by what? Faith. Now let's use my paraphrase. For we walk by the Word and not by the senses. Anybody get that? We walk by the Word. So the Word of God is my guideline. Well, how can I ever be afraid of anything? How dare I say that I'm scared? How dare I say that I'm afraid? I am pointing my bony finger in the face of God and calling him a liar without even realizing it because it's God my Father that said, you have not been given the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So if you have fear, it didn't come from God. And you don't have any business with it. It's dishonoring to God. Yes, you could be scared. I could be scared every minute of every day, but I retired from it because I haven't been given that spirit. I don't need it. So I'm not afraid of anything, not even you. And I've been exactly where you've been. I stood over the body of my little eight-year-old son that had been run over by a car, and the doctor walked out of the room and told me he was dead. I've been there. I've walked there. I stood by the casket of my wife's younger sister who died of cancer. And then shortly thereafter, her husband, someone jumped in the car behind him and blew his brains out in the car. He died. Shortly after that, their oldest son committed suicide. I've been there. But you don't hear me talking about that because that doesn't magnify the Lord. That doesn't honor him. And it ain't going to bring them back to talk about it. Her younger brother died of an overdose of narcotics. One of her younger brothers. I was there and stood on the porch when they jacked up my car and repossessed it and took it away. I know what it is to have something taken away from me. Yeah, I was there when the man came in the house and came upstairs with a little two-wheel dolly and went over in the corner and unplugged the TV set and wrapped the cord around the back of the TV, pushed the dolly up underneath it, strapped the cord around it, and took my TV in repossession. I've been there. I stood in the court when I had to declare bankruptcy because I couldn't pay my bills and I couldn't take care of my children and my wife. I've been there. I've been there when I had a tumor in my body, and at that time I didn't know how to walk by the word. The churches that I went to said that all died out and went out with the early church. When the last apostle died, it didn't work anymore. And thank God for doctors, thank God for medicine, thank God for operations. And they cut the thing out, but the doctor told me that it might grow in the other side of my chest cavity later on. I can't say for sure, but this type of tumor sometimes will. Vestiges of it will remain and float over to the other side. Yeah, and one day it did, one day it did, one day it came over there and it grew and grew and grew but I knew what the word said and I cursed the thing in the name of Jesus yes it took me 11 months to stand because I was a baby in faith I didn't really know it all I had it in my head more than my heart but I kept saying it I believe I'm healed based on the word of God and faith cometh by hearing yes. it didn't say who you had to hear it from you can hear it from your own mouth yes. and if you can't believe your mouth whose mouth are you going to believe God raised Fred Price up as an apostle of faith to the African-American community and beyond. In 2009, a group of ministers conducted a ceremony to bestow that title upon him. He oversaw the church and ever-increasing faith ministries, along with the ministerial alliance he founded, the Fellowship of International Christian Word of Faith Ministries. After turning the church over to his son, he continued speaking on occasion and did some writing, Apostle Price used to say, God created the family before he created the church. So family is always going to be more important to me. And here he is with his family. His wife of 67 years, Betty, Angela, Cheryl, Stephanie, and Fred Jr., all of whom were on staff at the church. He finished the work God gave him to do, and he left behind a great ministry and an incredible legacy. 
I used to watch him all the time on TV, and I thank God for the impact he had on me and millions of others over the years. He will be missed, but we rejoice in his homegoing, where he's now in the presence of the God he trusted through many trials in his faith journey. Well done, brother.